is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on at God Tell. Well, I keep stepping on my cord. I didn't used to do that. But now I do. I don't know if my feet got bigger or what. My wife was having problems. I bought her a cordless mic in, that, in Livingston. She uses that. I just can't get used to them cordless mics. I had one I like Janet. Uh, what's Jackson? Janet had one of those, you know, you, I didn't feel very comfortable. And every time I looked in the mirror, I didn't look any better. So I quit using that. I <clears throat> gave that to one of my other sons. I guess he still got it. Well, here we are. It's Wednesday night. We didn't do it. It wasn't our fault. Somehow it just happened. But we're in Romans chapter 2. It's a continuation of last week's message. The title of it is God's Impartial Judgment. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judge another, thou condemns thyself, for that, for thou that judges does the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, and do the same? that you shall escape the judgment of God? Or despise you the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance? But after the hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, upon every soul of man that does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall perish without the law. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are justified before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Let's go back to verse 1. Now, I know you forgot, those of you that were around when I said this before, whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to ask yourself, wherefore the therefore, or what's the therefore, therefore? Therefore always connects a thought from before to a thought that's coming. So he's referring this, what he's saying now, as a completion of what he said in chapter 1. Therefore, because we've gone over this material, because we talked to you about the immorality that God says is abominable, and about the sin that people are committing, whether it be the sin of homosexuality, or lying, cheating, drunkenness, adultery, it doesn't matter. Sin is sin. And uh, because of that, therefore, you have no excuses. There are no excuses. Everybody that's been here and has heard the word of God, when you stand before God, if you don't get into heaven, it won't be our fault, and you will not have an excuse. You'll be in hell, and I hope I'll be there to say, I told you so. You say, oh, you wouldn't do that, would you, brother? Sure would. 
and so would God. In fact, he'll probably just look at me and say what he said. Jesus did this over and over and over where he says, I tell you before it happened, so when it happens, you'll know I already told you about it. In other words, I told you so. Same thing. You're, you have no excuses. There is no reason, none, for any person on the face of this earth to ever die and go to hell. God made a way of escape, and it's all wrapped up in a choice. You can choose to trust Jesus, let him have your life, and let him do what he wants to with it. Or you can say, no, thank you. That's the choice you have. And you will make that choice. Even if you don't say the words, you will make the choice. That's why Jesus said you will know them by the fruit. We don't believe everybody that tells us they're Christians. In fact, the majority of people over the years, we've had over a million people through our three missions, the majority of the people that told me they're Christians were liars. When I preach in churches, I've preached all over the country, in about 600 revival meetings, and most of the people in those churches say they're Christians and they're liars. A lot of people have got this weird idea that if you go to church, they're talking to a guy this morning at the park, my wife asked him if he was a Christian. He said, I was born and raised Baptist. And before I could say anything, my wife said, well, that don't matter. Doesn't matter if you were born in a church. Doesn't matter if you were part of the bricks. If you do not trust Jesus, it doesn't matter what role your name is on. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to a man who was Lutheran and one of his employees was Catholic. And we got to talking about the fact that it's Jesus in your heart that matters, not what church you go to, which he agreed with, and she did too. I was glad of that. Most people like to argue. They didn't argue with me, which is a good thing. It's not smart to argue with a preacher. They usually get you. So, man, yeah, well, I shouldn't say a preacher, some preachers, because there's a lot of phonies out there. Therefore, you don't have any excuses, whoever you are, the judge, and yet you do the same kind of stuff. Oh, you may not do the exact same sin, but it doesn't matter. Sin is sin. So a person who's a homosexual in God's eyesight and a liar, a person that's a liar are equal in their sin. They both need Jesus to get into heaven. And Jesus told a story about a woman in John chapter 8, verse 9. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, my understanding of adultery is that it takes two. But she was caught, I think this, she was caught in the act of adultery, but how can she commit adultery without a man? But they didn't bring the man in. So Jesus knew they were a bunch of hypocrites. The law said in Deuteronomy that if a man and woman commit adultery, they should be taken outside the camp and stoned to death. Aren't you glad we don't follow that anymore? We don't because there's mercy and there's grace, but God will take care of it. Well, they brought her this woman. We took her in the act of adultery, in the very act. And Jesus kind of rolled his eyes and didn't say anything. Then he stooped down on the ground and started writing. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote, but I know what he wrote. He wrote the secret sins of each one of those men that were standing there. Because what the reaction was, was that from the oldest to the youngest, that means from the smartest to the dumbest, they started leaving. He exposed their hearts. When they all left, he looked at the woman and he said, where, where are those guys that were condemning you? She said, I don't know, they just all left. He said, well, I don't condemn you either, but go and sin no more. That's what repentance is all about. Repentance is not, I'm sorry for my sin. Repentance is I make a choice, a conscious choice, not to do it anymore. You got a perfect example of that with King David. You know, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had her husband killed so he could marry her because she was pregnant with his child. And then the prophet came in and he got exposed. The Bible says you stand naked before the living God. He was naked before God. <laughs> he got exposed. Instead of justifying himself, he admitted his sin. He acknowledged his sin, and he repented of his sin. And David, you read the rest of his life, he never did that again. 
ever. Why was David called a man after God's own heart? Because David never tried to hide his sin. He always acknowledged that God was right and he was wrong. Most people don't do it. They justify. Oh, Brother June, you don't understand. Oh, I know we're committing adultery, but you got to understand, we love each other. You know how many people have told me that and they're not together anymore? A lot. Where does it say in the Bible you can commit adultery if you love each other? That'd be like saying, I know God loves me so I can rob a bank. I need the money. I could use it. That's true. So I could justify robbing a bank. I could beat my wife up and say she deserved it. She probably does, but that doesn't mean I can do it. She's not in here right now. Oh, no, she's not in here right now. She's not going to hear me. That's good. I don't want to be a really long ride home, you know. I mean, you can justify anything you want to, but not before God. Sin is just sin. You just need to admit it. And you know, it's dumb to try to hide your sin because God already knows it. I mean, when are you going to get it through your heads? God knows everything. I love to tell people this. God knows what you're thinking tomorrow. You have trouble remembering and knowing what you're thinking right now. God knows what you do in the shower. He does. You can't hide anything from God. He sees it all. I asked my wife one time, you know, we've got six children. Of course, it took me a long time to find out how we did that. Uh, I just thought they came in a cabbage patch or something. And, but I asked my wife one day, I said, Honey, we've got six children. Now, you know how those things came about. Yeah. I said, Do you think God knows what we were doing? She said, he sure does. <laughs> sure he does. He knows everything. You know, God doesn't get embarrassed. He's the one that created sex. But he also created sex to be used properly. And most people in our country, especially in America, they don't use it properly. They get married four or five times, which is nothing but legalized adultery. You ought to read the Bible. God's against divorce. But who cares? I've, I've met people. I had a, one lady not too long ago. I was checking in at the mission in Nacogdoches. She had five children with her, no husband. And every child had a different last name. Well, I know what she's been doing. And God's not happy with that. Shouldn't be that way. And you know, the divorce rate is over 50% in America. And it's the same in the church. The divorce rate's the same in the church, and it shouldn't be that way. There are actually people who get divorced and remarried to somebody else, and they still all go to the same church together. And the pastors don't have the guts to stand up and say, you guys need to get out of here. That's what he should be doing. It's sin. I've known people who, you know, were in the beer business and were deacons. I know people that do all kinds of things they shouldn't be doing, yet they've got this high official sounding office in the church. God's not happy with all that. <clears throat> so be careful you don't accuse somebody of something and you're doing something very similar. We are sure that the judgment of God, verse 2, is according to truth. When God judges you, it's right. And them which commit such things. And when he talks about the committing such things, he's talking about chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, where he talked about men with men and women with women. In Deuteronomy, we read that last week, it says it's an abomination. I have never understood that. I've, I just, I can't fathom why two men would want to make love to each other. I, it makes no sense to me. It's against nature. Or two women. Or a man and a dog. There was a guy recently tried to get a marriage license for him and his dog. And it's coming. And you know, these people, these do-gooders, they're, oh, we need to let people do what they want to do. Well, that's why our country's falling apart. 
because we let everybody get away with what they want to get away with. Think this. Think on this. You that judge and do the same things, do you think you're going to escape? Do you think you're going to get away with it? If you think you're going to get away with it, you got another thing coming. You know, two, oh, two milliseconds after death, you'll be standing before God and you'll know better. Or do you despise the riches and goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, the patience of God? Or don't you know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? In other words, God is good and this reason he hasn't killed us all already is he gives us space to repent. I personally know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has a sense of humor. Because if God didn't have a sense of humor, we'd all be dead. I'm sure he looks at us and shakes his head and says, boy, these people are doing some really dumb things. He started that with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Hey, boy, man, you messing around my tree. You shouldn't have got that golden avocado. You thought it was an apple, but the Bible doesn't say apple, so I got a golden avocado tree. Besides, I saw a movie in the 1980s. It was produced in Hollywood. <coughs> Thank you. It was produced in Hollywood, and Adam and Eve bit into a golden avocado. And I know that Hollywood never lies. What, you don't believe Superman really flies? Oh, come on now. Superman was my hero when I was a kid. George Reeves, he was the quintessential Superman before all these other guys who look like they've been in the gym building muscles all day. He, he didn't have those kind of muscles, but he had superpowers. And I remember one year, for I think it was Christmas, I, they gave me a red cape. I put that cape on. Run, <laughs> run around the yard as fast as I can trying to take off. I never did get off the ground, but it sure was a lot of fun trying. And you people don't believe Superman can fly. My goodness. Exodus 34, 6 talks about the goodness of God. You ought to write that down and read it sometime. But after the hardness and impenitent, that's a, a heart that's not conducive to repent. You store up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Righteous judgment means a fair judgment. When God judges you, if you don't like what he judges you, you need to remember one thing, that God is always fair. He will never judge you for what somebody else did. If he said you did it, you did it. And boy, he's got it all marked down. Of course, he used to write it in a big book. Well, now he's got a secretary with a computer. Probably got Windows 10 in it. She can't make it work right. He will render to every man according to their deeds. Galatians 6, 7. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap life everlasting. That's where the choice is. You choose. Let me tell you something that may shock you. You don't have to sin. You sin because you choose to. You could make right choices. I've done it too. Sometimes I still make wrong choices. Not as big as the wrong choices I used to make, but that's from man's point of view. God says it's to sin. You don't have to sin. It's a choice. Adam didn't have to eat the fruit. It was a choice. And when Jesus came, he didn't have to go to the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and my sin. It was a choice. And he went, boy, I'm glad he went. Because if he hadn't, there'd be no salvation. There'd be nothing. Except a little bit of life, miserable life. It's pretty miserable in this world. If you try to accomplish anything, you'll find out. Now, if you're not accomplishing anything and all you want to do is sit around in the park and look at the fireflies at night, you might have a pretty lackadaisical kind of easy life.
But if you really try to work and do things, it's hard. That's why they call it work. It's hard. <clears throat> Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit, by their deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. We do this by seeking God diligently. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. He diligently seeking God, not casually. But unto them that are contentious, argumentative, and won't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. There's a verse in Job I want to look at quickly. I think I got it marked. Yes, I do. Job 24, 13. They are of those. He's talking about people who have, this is Job speaking, talking about people who have disobeyed God. They are of those that rebel against the light. God is light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the paths thereof. The murderer rising with the light kills the poor and the needy in the night. Just like a thief. The eye also of adultery waits for twilight, saying, Nobody's going to see me. I'm going to sneak over there. And my wife won't even know I went. She'll figure it out eventually. So he disguises his face. In the dark, they dig through houses, which they had marked for themselves in the daytime. You know what that means. That means going and scoping something out, uh, checking it out. Uh, what do they call that? Uh, Oh, I forgot the word. Casing the joint. Casing the joint. Thank you, Josh. Casing the joint. And then they come back at night, break in, steal stuff, you know. Nobody will break into my house. We have a pet alligator. Out on the front, instead of beware of the dog, it says beware of the alligator. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just trying to see if he'll smile or something. They, they, they go around here committing sin, just working at it, you know. We had a couple staying with us in Nacogdoches, and they went to court this week for shoplifting at Walmart. And when they got out of jail a few weeks ago, the girl got arrested the same day she got out for doing it again. You know, and I'm looking at my wife, and I said, wouldn't it just be easier to go get a job than to go through all that and end up with all these court costs you're going to have to pay and and restitution you're going to have to make, and, and then that be on your record. Wouldn't it be easier just to go get a job? Amen. Well, my wife looked at me and said, yeah, it'd be easier. But people haven't figured that out. I remember back before I was a Christian, we always used to steal and do stuff. We'd work plans out and stuff, and that was hard work. And I found out I could get a job and it'd be easier. Of course, that's, after I became a Christian, that's what I did. Of course, I've been working for God till for 40 years. I guess I'm going to retire one of these days. Someday. And to the people who do this stuff, tribulation and anguish, that's torments, adversity. And this is like a prayer. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil. You know, read some of the prayers of King David in, a, in the book of Psalms. God, I got some enemies. Would you do me a favor? What's that, son? Kill them. He prayed some rough prayers. And people always come to me and say, Brother Gene, will you pray for me? I said, I will, but you probably won't like it. Because most of the time my prayers are like, Lord, give them whatever they need in their life to straighten them out. If that means you got to slap them down and put them in the hospital, do it. I had two heart attacks in November. I was overweight, and I had uh, I wasn't exercising much at all, and I was having some physical problems. Arthritis was just about eating me up. And this morning it hit me in the head. Having a heart attack was good. Because you see, since I got out of the hospital, I've been on a diet. I've lost 22 pounds. We're walking, walking 30 minutes a day, a mile and a half a day. 
chugging along there as fast as we can go. My wife got on the same diet with me. She's lost over 30 pounds. She just needs to lose about 15 more. <laughs> I told her if she gets down in the 120s, I'll take her somewhere. I won't leave her. I'll bring her back. But I got to realizing, you know, it is true what the Bible says. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. It's just a shame God had to have me have a heart attack because if I was smart and if I had been listening, I would have been on a diet before because mostly what I ate was junk food. I like junk food. I grew up on junk food. The four basic food groups. Potato chips, candy bars, sodas, and cigarettes. That's what I grew up on. Canned food, you know, just fatty stuff. I was one of those guys, you could give me a pork chop, I'd cut the fat off the pork chop and <laughs> suck it down like a slug. I don't like fatty foods, I just do, you know. Quit all that. Quit eating white bread, quit eating white potatoes, quit eating white rice. All the things that turn into sugar, you know, immediately. <coughs> And the weight just started coming off. I want to lose about five more pounds and then try to keep it there. But you know, for years I tried to lose weight and I never could get under 200 pounds. Now I'm down 179. I'm almost back to fighting weight. I'm just too old to fight. And to those who do right, and that would be with Jesus in your heart, obviously, because without Jesus, the Bible says you can do nothing. Nothing of any relevance, importance. To those that are doing what they're supposed to be doing, glory, honor, peace to every man that works good. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Now this is very important. For there is no respect of persons with God. Doesn't matter what color you are. Doesn't matter what family breeding you have, lineage you have. Doesn't matter if you got money or don't have money. The only thing God does say that he let me know about is that all you guys that have too much hair, you're going to have a hard time getting into heaven because he's only going to let bald people in. So I'm working on that. And you know what is amazing? Most of you guys that have all that hair aren't even using it. If I had your hair, I could be a TV preacher. I could be saying... Hello, folks. Keep those cards and letters coming in. Don't forget to drop some money in that envelope. I could, but who wants to see a bald man on TV asking for money? You watch some TV preachers. They're all good-looking guys wearing shiny rings and clothes and Rolex watches. I was reading about some of them this week. They're, the new thing now is shoes that cost anywhere from 1000 to $5,000. They look like tennis shoes to me. But they're not. They're custom made, you know. Just And a lot of preachers are going to be in trouble because people are reading that stuff now. Um, Jesse Duplantis went on stage to preach and he was wearing a $1,500 coat. Can you? It's ridiculous. And then they're crying about, you need to send us some money. I was watching TBN one time and Jan Crouch said, you need to send us some money or we'll have to pull one of our satellites down. Well, that's just plain stupid. I wonder how many gullible people are. You don't pull a satellite down. How much would it cost to pull a satellite down? More than it costs to put it up there. But she made that plea, you know, and people, I'm sure people got their checkbooks out and started writing, you know. Oh, those poor people. They were worth over a billion dollars before they died, personally. A billion. And preachers ain't worth that much. I was in a meeting one time where a preacher's salary was voted on. He got $100,000. It was a large church. Somebody looked at me and said, Brother June, what do you think about that? I said, I don't know a preacher anywhere in this country that's worth $100,000, including myself. We deserve to live. The Bible tells us that. But it gets kind of ridiculous. And a lot of people are in it for the money. And the love of money is what? It's the root of all evil. Not money. The love of money. Wow. 
<clears throat> there's no respect to persons. God doesn't care what you look like. If you don't like what you look like, take it up with God. I didn't do it. I don't always like what I look I liked what I looked like when I was young, and I got pictures to prove it. But boy, I got old. And when I passed 70, things started happening. Saggings took place where they shouldn't be. Wrinkles are coming up. I don't heal like I used to, so I'm a lot more careful now. We gave away our bicycles this week. I told Nancy, I said, we don't need to be riding bicycles anymore. Because if we fall down, we're going to get hurt. She did. She agreed with me, so we've given our bicycles away. And uh, I get hurt just walking and falling down. I fell down a few weeks ago in the, at the park tree root sticking up and out of the asphalt. I tripped on it, fell on, hit my face on the asphalt. Well, my lip was sticking out. It was puffy for three days. And I was miserable. And all I had to do was watch where I was walking. But no, not me. I'm too busy looking at other things. Now I walk with my head down. Watching every crack in the sidewalk. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, God will notice it. He will see it. And if you sin, now listen carefully, as many as have sinned without the law, that's the Gentiles. They didn't have the law. They shall perish without the law. And as many have sinned in the law, that's the Jews. You see, God gave the law originally to the Jewish people and told them to go out and evangelize the world. Well, they didn't do that. Because the Jews got a tradition going that only Jewish people were going to heaven. I have some friends that are Church of Christ that think they're the only ones going to heaven. It has nothing to do with what denomination you belong to. And the Jews thought that if you were rich and if you were healthy, you were automatically going to heaven. They thought all the people that had any kind of illness or sickness were sinners because they believed that sin caused all sickness. And if you didn't have money, it's because you were a sinner. So God wasn't blessing you. They believe that. There's some Jewish people in the Orthodox Jews still believe that today. It's stupid, but they believe it. And I'm glad God looks at the heart of man and not the pocketbook. Because if some of you had to rustle some money up to get into heaven, you wouldn't make it tonight, would you? No. You'd have to take out a loan. When you come to Brother, Brother June, can I borrow some money? I said, what do you got for collateral? I'll take your firstborn. The Gentiles, which we'll cover next week, without the law became a law unto themselves because they did by nature the things that God said to do without anybody telling them. The Jewish people had the law and God told them everything they needed to do. There's 360 commandments in the Old Testament and New Testament put together. And the Ten Commandments are headings over those commandments. The Jews had it all. But so did Adam, didn't he? I mean, can you imagine living in a world where you only had one rule? I would love to live in a world like that. One rule. And man couldn't even keep that one rule. Of course, he had help from his wife. Well, he did. He said, Lord, it's the woman you gave me. That's where that started with Adam in Genesis chapter 3. And a woman tried to pass the blame. She said, the serpent, he beguiled me. He looked at Satan and Satan didn't have anybody else to blame. He said, I guess I'm your man. And God took his legs away and said, you're going to crawl around on your belly the rest of your life. And that's why snakes crawl on their belly. In case you don't, you got to read that sometime. <clears throat> Listen carefully now as we close. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. James 1.22, be ye doers of the law, not hearers deceiving your own self. Adam was a hearer of the law of God. One law. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Listen carefully. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven 
But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. The works of God are found in John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29. The work of God is that you believe on him whom God has sent. That's the first one. That's the one that gets you into heaven. But many shall come and say, but Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That means preached. And in your name we cast out devils. And in your name have done many wonderful works. Sounds like the good guys, doesn't it? Jesus says, I profess to you, I don't know you depart from me, you that work sin. That's amazing. What was their sin? Unbelief. They wouldn't believe. They were trusting their good works to get them into heaven. And they're not going to get there. The Jewish people thought they were going to get into heaven because they were Jewish. And Jesus told them flat out, he said, the murderers, the liars, the cheats, the adulterers, they're going to get into heaven before you. Because you see, those people somewhere in their life finally recognize they need Christ. But people like the Jewish folks, the Orthodox Jews that were, <coughs> they think of themselves as being good. That's why I hate, literally, when people respond to this question, how are you? I'm good. That's a lie. <coughs> None of us are good. Not one. The only good person is God. The only one. As long as you think you're good, you're not going to look for Jesus. And why do you think Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven? Why does a rich man need God? He's got everything. Bill Gates got a hundred billion dollars. He's got more money than some small countries. Why does he need God? But he is changing his tune now that he's getting older. I'm glad to hear that. But for a long time, he didn't like God at all. Didn't need God. And you got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, who am I trusting? Please don't trust another person. They won't get you there. They can make a choice for themselves and that's it. <coughs> Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for each one in the room tonight and we pray, Father, that you would cause them to be listeners that do. Taking the word of God and making it applicable in their lives. We know from what your word tells us, that just knowing what's in the Bible is not enough. We've got to be doers of the word. Otherwise, we're just lying to ourselves. And I get kind of frustrated with people because they have all these different answers about what makes them a Christian, what makes them have the ability to get into heaven. And of course, like that man this morning, we've heard that so many times. I'm, I was, my daddy was a Baptist preacher. I was born in a Methodist home, you know, and it has nothing to do with anything. And fortunately, when we talked to that man a little further, he understood that. I hope there's nobody in here that's trusting something that's on a piece of paper written by men because maybe they were confirmed or baptized. A lot of baptized people are going to be in hell because they never trusted Jesus. We thank you that if we trust him, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Bless this evening, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.